We have many people joining us. I already see 131. I expect those numbers to climb. So I simply like to acknowledge the groups who are joining us today. We have representatives from government joining us today, both central, provincial, and local governments, water and sanitation utilities, academic organizations, as well as international development organizations and financial institutions. NGOs, CSOs, and philanthropic organizations are also with us today, as well as private sector representing products, services, and consultancies. And finally, we welcome members of the media. A hearty welcome to all of you. To start off, just a brief, a few brief words about our webinar today. Let's set the stage. We know that investments in the wastewater and sanitation sector continue to favor large sewer systems, especially in bigger cities. But there are many issues with these large centralized systems. As you know, they are very expensive. It is difficult to introduce these new systems into existing and densely populated cities and towns. And then, of course, people on the fringes of urban centers or those living in informal settlements, they are often left behind. And even worse, there's little evidence that these heavy investments improve sanitation services or improve public health for those who need it most. So for those reasons, the goal of delivering sanitation to all has been elusive. Citywide inclusive sanitation, also known as CYS, offers a different approach. It shifts how we think, design, and implement sanitation projects by choosing the right mix of systems and technologies, whether sewered, or non-sewered or on-site, as well as regulations that deliver a safe, equitable, and reliable sanitation process. Inclusive sanitation also promotes sustainability, taking treatment further into resource recovery and embracing the commercial use of waste products. So in today's webinar, you will hear several case studies and project examples that show how inclusive sanitation can be delivered through a selection of appropriate systems and technologies. And to build on yesterday's, or excuse me, Tuesday's uh, topic on governance, our presenters will also touch on regulations that ensure safe practices are maintained, as well as performance indicators to monitor the delivery of sanitation services. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Isabel Blackett is a sanitation specialist and independent consultant. Her interest is in increasing equity and working with governments to develop at scale poor inclusive sanit urban sanitation services. Isabel's presentation has been pre-recorded, but she is present with us today and is available for the discussion period. So Isabel, we look forward to your presentation. Hello everyone. I will briefly outline the main types of sewered and non-sewered sanitation system. Then a few of the factors to consider during selection. And finally, a summary of the key messages and where you can find more information. The sanitation service chain illustrates how human waste is transported from toilets to treatment and then onto disposal or end use as a recycled product. This is also called the sanitation value chain. It's the same concept. The sanitation service chain can be achieved in two main ways through a networked or sewered system transporting waste from toilet to treatment, or through a non-networked or non-sewered system, where the waste is disposed first into a septic tank or improved pit, and then after storage is removed and transported to treatment. This is called faecal sludge management or FSM. The treated wastes from both systems can then be reused in a variety of different ways. This diagram presents some types of sewage system. There are other combinations and variations possible too. Sewers collect wastewater from domestic, commercial, institutional, industrial, and other types of property. All require a property connection. The wastewater then flows along the sewers. Conventional sewage flows by gravity or it can be pumped. The wastewater may be kept separate in a foul sewer or it may be mixed with stormwater in a combined sewer. Other types of sewerage include shallow, simplified and condominial systems. Sewage treatment can be carried out in one or two or three large centralised treatment plants or decentralised into multiple smaller treatment facilities. Also, septic tanks can be connected to a solids-free or small bore sewer 
and the effluent can be treated. And finally, the treated waste can be safely reused in agriculture or as animal feed or fuel. Non-sewered sanitation systems require improved hygienic on-site toilets at scale, including for many households who don't have them. These are often people living in rented accommodation or in areas of high groundwater or on houses above lakes, rivers or the sea or rocky terrain or steep hill sides. The emptying and conveyance of the faecal waste can be, can be carried out through motorised tankers, trucks or other vehicles of various um, types and sizes or by improved manual emptying using pumps into large containers with onward transfer to treatment. The removed faecal sludge is then taken somewhere and treated so that it is safe and then it can be discharged or processed further for reuse in agriculture or as a solid or powdered fuel or for animal feed. First we need to consider the existing city sanitation situation. In this faecal waste flow diagram or SFD on the left hand side you can see that 22% of the population use off-site sanitation systems or sewerage and 78% of the population use on-site sanitation systems. The green arrows show the safe sanitation chains which don't require immediate attention. In this example 20% of the waste is safely managed, 9% of that is through the network sewerage system and 11% is through safe FSM or non-network systems. The red arrows show you where the faecal waste is unsafely managed and where it poses a risk. In this case 80% of the population produce faecal waste which is unsafely managed, most of it through unsafe SSM but also through untreated sewage. The SFD helps us to see the main sanitation service gaps and challenges in the city. In this example, there are three main areas that require attention. Dysfunctional sewerage, which appears to be mostly leakage during transport. Unsafe pits and septic tanks. And in many other cities, this includes open defecation. An unsafe disposal of sludge and septage from on-site sanitation, either from the facility itself or during emptying, or faecal sludge that has been emptied but not taken for treatment. The identified gaps lead directly to what needs to be improved and provide an estimate of the scale of the action needed. So in this example, the sewerage needs to be improved and probably extended too. Fixing the sewers and the pumps may immediately solve 13% of the challenges. On-site sanitation needs work too, around 40% of it is inadequate. However, it is faecal sludge management that needs the most attention and this could reduce unsafe disposal by 66%. Next we need to consider the services from a user perspective. Do people use private toilets or are they obliged to share? Is there any open defecation? You must include the entire population including the informal and the poor areas in this assessment. Is there affordable access to regulated safe FSM services or is it informal and unregulated? What is the housing like? Is it multi-storey or single storey? Is it owner occupied or rented? Is there a reliable affordable piped water supply? Are the users satisfied with their toilet and with the neighbourhood's cleanliness, hygiene and smell? And what improvements do they want and what are they willing to pay for? Build on what exists and provide the improvements that people are willing to pay for. Next, we need to consider the policy, institutional and regulatory environment. Are the institutional mandates for managing sewered and non-sewered services clearly defined? What is the capacity of these institutions to operate and manage sewerage services and, and sewage treatment? And are the private sector involved, either formally or informally? Now, how much capacity development will be needed and in what areas? 
and other regulations that will support these new investments. For example, are sewer connections mandatory? Are there any national tariff models? Um, are FSM providers able to legally register themselves? And finally, are the regulations that are there, are they practical, are they enforceable, and are they incentivized? One way to assess this might be to use the City Sanitation Service Delivery or CSDA tool. It is designed to help stakeholders work together to review the policy institutions and regulations for sewered and for non sewered services. Finally, for a city wide approach, select a mix of sanitation services which will complement past and ongoing sanitation in investments. A project should not be in isolation. For example, what are the government sanitation funds being spent on? And what are the other development partners doing in the same city? What service gaps could an ADB project fill within the overall sanitation plan of the city? And always balance the infrastructure investment with funding for capacity development, IT, regulatory and M&E systems and community engagement funding. For example, in CNRIP, government and development partners are in different ways contributing to sanitation development. The World Bank's WASIP project was designed specifically to fill the gaps in the sanitation chains. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through this slide, but you can see it and more in Guidance Note 9 presentation on the CWIS Knowledge Hub tab of the ASD website. So to summarise, safe sanitation can be effectively provided by sewered and non-sewered sanitation systems. And most cities require a mix of these sanitation systems to enable them to serve everybody. The factors that must be considered include um, the existing sanitation services, the gaps and the priority areas, providing better services to households at tariffs that they are willing to pay for, the need for supportive policy institutions and regulations, and planning a citywide approach to contribute to different but complementary investments. There are many practical resources available on sewer and non sewer sanitation, such as these. If you look on the Knowledge Hub tab of the ASD website, you will find all these links and guidance notes 9 and 10, and much more. I hope they will be useful for your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. That was a wonderful introduction to the topic of our webinar here today, which is CY's Mix and Match Approach to Sanitation Technologies. At this time, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Manas. Manas has developed business models for public-private partnerships and investments in wastewater treatment and FSM services, studied costs and policy implications of small-scale sewage treatment technologies, and worked with city and state governments on strategies to make cities more livable and sustainable. We welcome you, Manas, and look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's very good to be here. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, holistic uh, citywide inclusive sanitation with a focus on the role for decentralized and small scale sewage treatment plants, as Isabel uh, you know, set a very good context uh, on the different options we have. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, India, for those who are not familiar, you know, we have uh, 500 million people or so living in urban India, uh, which is 3,000 or so towns, uh, which have a population of over 20,000 people. And then there are towns with less than 20,000 people, which are on top of that. Uh, we have about 500 cities uh, with over 100,000 people population. Uh, you have a large number of people living in small towns, um, you know, 120 million people living in towns with less than 100,000 people. And typically these towns are the ones that are neglected in the urban planning, urban investment programs, uh, including the more recent Amrut program and smart city program and so on. Uh, we have absolutely dismal ratings when it comes to livability. Um, and uh, while there is growing investment in the urban space, you know, just spending money doesn't mean we will solve problems. We need to know what we are doing and how we're doing it. Just on the right, you see a little schematic. Small towns are facing by and large three problems. You have a resource scarcity problem, you have a climate change problem, and you have a rapid urbanization problem. 
and uh, the three factors below make these problems worse, which is we've got very weak capabilities in local government. Uh, we don't have well-established uh, model, service models, technology, especially that are suitable for small towns. Maybe for big cities, it's okay, but not for small towns. And then we've got the inadequate uh, budget and investment, which make us particularly vulnerable to the three factors above. So now when we think about CWIS at border, we think about, uh, you know, let's break it down. What is sanitation to us? Uh, what is in, what is out, what's the goal of sanitation? Now we can we can define sanitation very narrowly or we can you know expand the scope a little bit. So we often look at, you know, does should water supply be considered along with, if not a part of sanitation, along with sanitation. Uh, when we think about city-wide solutions, we think about planning, uh, infrastructure, etc. Do we think about water bodies? Uh, where's the water coming from? Uh, solid waste management, uh, you know, urban agriculture, peri-urban agriculture, green spaces. You know, how do we how do we get the right definition so that we're thinking at the right scale and we're thinking about synergies that could exist instead of isolating things and then replicating or you know, missing out on synergies? And then, of course, the circular economy aspect is, is extremely important uh, in our thinking. Uh, the inclusive part, how do we reach everybody and especially the slums, as uh, I think as Andrea mentioned in her introduction, these are the areas that get left out. Uh, affordability, you know, the right set of tariffs, not free, but you know, the right tariffs uh, which are affordable, uh, what are the capex contributions that people should make towards the infrastructure so they feel a sense of ownership and responsibility and then finally maintenance is extremely important because in india especially we have this cycle which we call the build neglect break and rebuild cycle um, and that especially affects the poor because the slums is where you get you know cheap cheap solutions you skim corners and then you have solutions that the people that need solutions the most their solutions tend to break the first uh, and then citywide, uh, you know, incremental solutions, but they should be planned in advance. So you're not breaking stuff at your next step of increment. You know, you plan for the whole thing, but then you implement it phase wise. What are the high priority regions in the town from a climate uh, resilience perspective, flooding perspective, poverty perspective, etc. Uh, unserved areas. Uh, how do we include peri-urban areas? Because eventually the city grows and you know, either it becomes a contiguous urban space or the municipality grows. And now you're the municipality having to manage services in these new areas. And they are very different from what the core city is like, right? So how do we think about peri-urban areas? Um, Long-term planning for funds, because when you don't plan the funds in advance, stuff tends to break more quickly. And uh, how do you integrate with the other services that I mentioned above, solid waste, et cetera? And then ultimately, who's accountable for all this? You know, who's taking responsibility? Which department, which person is going to you know, take responsibility? Now, just very quickly on this, uh, the left side graph, which shows for centralized systems, decentralized systems, and for FSM, what is the capex per person broadly? That's the orange box. And what is the operating cost per person per year for the different technology choices? So you see, obviously, centralized systems, they have a very high capex, $130 to $340 per person to build the system and then 25 to $50 per person per year to maintain it. Doesn't sound like much, but in a city which may have, you know, 50, 60% who are poor, it becomes a lot of money. Uh, you get a decentralized system, which we'll talk about, which are the small scale STPs, small scale sewers, uh, not citywide uh, systems. Uh, they're much less expensive. And FSM, of course, is very, very inexpensive, which makes it popular and, uh, and very doable. Now, each of these have pros and cons, and we'll discuss that on the next slide. So uh, citywide, Solution really is about saying, understanding the pros and cons of each, mapping it to the city, and then being able to apply saying, this is what should go here and this is what should go there. Uh, each of these have a government spending component and a private spending component. For example, for FSM, the septic tanks are privately funded, right? Uh, and a good city sanitation plan should help make these decisions of what system to build, where to build it, and when to build it. And how does that integrate, how does that integrate with a broader plan for the city in terms of the master plan, the vision, et cetera? And then coming back to the question of who is in charge, what are their skills on multi-dimensional skills, technology, finance, management, et cetera. What's the tenure? Is there continuity or do you have these sharp breaks where people come in and go out and then you have this lack of continuity, which leads to lack of responsibility and accountability. Uh, and then what authority do these bodies have to find people, charge people, change rates, or are they constantly overridden by other uh, parties? So I'll go through this quickly. The centralized system, the key advantage is it handles all your wastewater. A single authority can have full control, so to speak, in theory, over the entire system. And then they can bundle the services along with water supply, property taxes, and you know, recover some amount of fees. Difficulties we have talked about, they're, bit, they're difficult to build, expensive to build. They don't cover the whole city because you'll have tiny lanes, you'll have gradients in the city. Uh, and it's 100% government responsibility, uh, which is not really shared with anyone. 
the decentralized STPs, uh, they're really a private investment because some campus, some building, real estate developer, household, whatever, is building the sewage treatment plant, the plumbing, the piping, everything. Now, people say, you know, this is expensive. Why should they have to bear it? Look, you know, today in, in, in India, it's 0.5% of a real estate development cost would go into a good quality sewage treatment system and recycling water, wastewater, the treated water recycling system. So it's really not going to break the bank for anyone to have to uh, do this uh, if they were required to do it. Again, 100% of your wastewater can be treated and you can actually reuse 40 to 80% depending on your technology. And that means your fresh water consumption, which actually is India's you know, probably bigger crisis today than the sanitation crisis, uh, you get to save uh, you know, 40 to 6, 40, 50, 80% on your fresh water consumption. Problems are what do you do with existing buildings that cannot retrofit? And then you, know, you need institutional structures for monitoring this, managing this from the government perspective, enforcing regulations and so on. FSM, I think others will talk more. It's very quick. It can be very cheap to do. It's a good partial solution. It handles your black water well, but it's not a complete solution. Less than 1% of your waste of your wastewater is actually collected and treated. The rest flows into the ground. It flows into open drains. Uh, it goes somewhere. It's, it can be quite hard to track offenders because of its distributed nature. But it really should be the first step um, the first, uh, yeah, first step in the solution. Now, these are just a bunch of photos. Uh, this is how you typically see disposal on the right side. On the left side is how it disposes into a STP. So you never see or smell the fecal sludge. Next, please. Uh, this is a fecal sludge treatment plant that we have designed and built in Ladakh. You know, completely natural, no smell. It's open air, but no smell. Works very well in all weather. Uh, costs uh, uh, $20,000 a year to maintain. Okay, very cheap. And this is a treatment plant, again, biological, natural systems in, uh, in Devanhali in Karnataka. Now, this is a small-scale sewage treatment plant built outside a hospital. The wastewater, what you see on the left is really the whole treatment plant. It's integrated with the nature. A lot of it is underground. And the wastewater is reused by the hospital for flushing and for landscaping. A few other systems, again, you know, you can really beautify your STPs uh, if you have a little bit of space and creativity. Uh, and the O&M costs are very, very low. And this is one where uh, we built a system for the metro system. The whole thing disappears underground. You never see it. Now, these are electromechanical systems. Again, they can be quite small. Uh, I'll just quickly touch upon two technologies. Now, you have you have an eight, eight time dif cost differential of different technologies. So technology choice is important. You can see MBR at a high end. Uh, that's, you know, that's uh, 2 to $10 per person per month is your life cycle cost over uh, 10 years. Uh, but you get drinking quality water. Uh, on the other hand, you've got nature-based solutions, which are very inexpensive. That's, you know, that's 30 cents to a dollar, dollar and a half per person per month. But you need more area and the quality of treated water may not be as good, but it's great for flushing and so on. You can build these in basements. And with automation, uh, you see a crashing of the O&M cost. This is a study we did. It was funded by the Gates Foundation, by, by the German government. Uh, you know, you can, you can download it. Uh, we studied different technology along with EWAG and IIT Madras. Uh, and our partners, CDD and Info, we looked at the cost and the uh, the regulatory issues around uh, you know managing these at, at scale, small scale distributed systems. For example, the city of Bangalore has got three thousand small scale STPs, um, and these are all decentralized. Government spends nothing on it. Unfortunately, they don't even monitor it well, so many of them don't work well, and that's where the institutional framework needs to be strengthened so that the systems do the job they're meant to. So here, very simply, what we believe is uh, that the government should invest, you know, 25%, maybe, maybe a little less, maybe a bit more of our national sanitation budget on decentralized solutions, on promoting decentralized STPs, small scale STPs and FSM. And what that will allow us to do is to get to very quickly, you know, three, four years, get to, you know, close to 100% coverage of basic sanitation for all our cities. And then you can continue if needed to build the sewer networks and the more complex stuff and keep improving that, but at least you have reached sort of, you know, step one as quickly as possible. Uh, we need holistic thinking for our cities. Uh, the more we compartmentalize, the more problems we have. And that's the little uh, image over there. We need to think about what are the goals for sanitation, okay? Uh, of course, pathogen and health is obvious. Pollution of water bodies is obvious, but can we link sanitation to minimizing water extraction, beautification of our cities, and also promoting affordability and inclusiveness? Uh, design and O&M of sanitation system must be done by trained, certified, and licensed firms. Today, anybody can get up and say, I'm a STP designer, and they'll find a client if they're cheap enough. Um, and lastly, government departments need to be uh, reconfigured to manage this. It's a scary thought for them to manage thousands of points of uh, potential disaster. It's not that big a problem. And if they put their minds to it and use uh, experts uh, to help them, uh, you know, we really can transform both the cost of providing sanitation solutions and the quality and the climate impact of it through water recycling and um, water reduction. Uh, with that, uh, I will end, so thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mana. So we appreciate your presentation. Uh, before we get started with questions, I just want to acknowledge that we see a number of resources posted in the chat already. Those resources will be posted on the event website under the CYS Knowledge Hub. So please encourage you to continue posting resources for each other since they will be provided to all of you after the event or during the event uh, on the event website. We now have a few minutes uh, time for some questions to Isabel and to Manas. I'm going to start with a question for both of you calling on Isabel first. Question has to do with climate change. So I'll just read it. While the CYS approach is being widely discussed and developed, does the approach think that climate change is an important agenda to be incorporated? Does it see climate change hazards to have an impact on the sanitation system and services? And relatedly, how is climate resilient systems and services being addressed in CY's planning? So uh, Isabel, would you like to have a go at that? And then we'll turn to Manas. Thank you, Andrea. And whoever asked that question, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, CY's um, focuses on sustainability. And if you are in an area where climate change is critical, you can't have any sustainability without considering it. So as far as we're concerned, it's just part of the the sustainability considerations um, and yeah it needs to be reminded uh, we need to be reminded about that and I think also it varies a great deal from place to place the geography of a city will determine the extent to which the climate change factors will um, impact on the design of the sanitation system. Thank you Isabel. Manas? So uh, I would say absolutely, and I would look at it from two perspectives. Uh, what we know today about climate change, how should it change the way we think about the system? So when we talk about you know ultra low water consumption system, how do we minimize water consumption, energy consumption? Those are sort of you know new awareness or new consciousness or new requirements created due to the climate change problem, right? And we need to, and that's why the, thinking more holistically about the city. If you can think about your sanitation along with solid waste, along with public spaces you will have a much more climate resilient city than if you think about those three uh, you know, pillars of infrastructure separately and build systems and operate systems uh, separately for all of them, right? So more integration can help us to address climate, uh, the new climate challenges. The other is good design. So, you know, um, you know, we, we design systems with very low margins in order to cut costs, to, to uh, reduce space and so on. And then when an extreme event hits you, you say, oh, that was an extreme event. And sometimes, no, it's not an extreme event. It's just that you designed it with not enough uh, headroom or net and not enough safety margins. So with climate change, I think we're going to recognize that this infrastructure, which might be around for the next 20, 30, 50 years, uh, has to be designed with much more uh, headroom, with much more uh, you know, margin of error in order to uh, absorb the shocks that are going to come our way. Uh, but each city needs to then think about, uh, and the flexibility of CWIS and the different solutions is you can actually, in the same city, you can plan different infrastructure with different factors using different technologies, depending on the vulnerability at a very, very micro scale, at a neighborhood scale. And uh, that gives you the flexibility with CWIS, which you don't get with a centralized one fit all uh, large sewer network. Thank you, Manas. Uh, before we leave the climate change topic, I just wanted to remind people there was a workshop on Monday that on, on that very topic and those materials can be downloaded from the event website as well. Let's go to a, another question for both of you. And this time I'll start with Manas. Uh, the question is for small scale systems, will the investment be sustainable without subsidy considering the higher cost of operations compared to bigger systems and the low willingness to pay? Are there any successful models that you can share with us? Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it needs work. Now, when I was very young, when cable television first came to India, we used to pay in today's dollars, we used to pay less than $1 a month for a cable TV subscription. Over a three year period, that became about seven or $8 a month and people were fine paying that, right? They just got used to it. Of course, the quality improved, but they were used to it. As I said, you know, actually the cost of doing decentralized systems is not high, but we need to get used to the fact that we have to spend it. And, you know, we spend a lot of things, you know, people spend lots of money on lots of things, but then they come to these things which are important and they say, oh, this is too expensive, right? So I think you have to just prioritize away from disposable income being spent on luxury items and, and consumer goods and saying these are basic necessities. We have to spend on that first. I don't think it's a financial issue. It needs to be enforced. People will get into the habit, but then the enforcement has to be consistent. Uh, if it is unfair, if I look at my neighbor and say, why, do, why does they get that and I have to pay for this? 
then it creates resentment then i will even if i can pay uh, i will object just on the principle of you know parity and justice uh, and therefore it needs to be a continuous structured program where everyone understands why this is important what they need to pay today tomorrow not just to build something but to operate it and i think people will fall into line actually not it's not that difficult but you need that discipline of how it is done and not throw out the idea because it was implemented badly uh, you know in, in ladakh we had a great situation we were invited by the government we got all the major hotel owners into a room and said look we're going to charge you 50 dollars a year to clean your septic tank now they were not used to this because they used to clean it once in many many years and pay somebody 30 50 dollars um but you know, they understood it's necessary groundwater is getting polluted and within you know, at the end of a two-hour discussion, we had a regulation passed where the municipality was able to charge every hotel a fee and enforce, uh, you know, annual uh, cleaning of septic tanks. And nobody raised an eyebrow. Nobody said a word about it. You know, so I think it's doable, but it requires thought and it requires fairness and it requires effort. Thank you, Manas. That's a great example. Uh, Isabel, would you like to add a few words before we move on to our next speaker? <laughs> Well, first of all, I don't think that small scale systems are necessarily any more expensive, um, quite the opposite, actually. And I think that very often the, the real costs of large scale systems and centralized sewerage are hidden um, and government subsidizes those systems. Um, I don't know whether they realize they're subsidizing them deliberately or not. Um, so, so implementing small scale systems can actually be more cost effective. Um, and who pays is a big question. Is government very often hides the cost of the big system. So I think if we're a little bit more transparent and we do our accounting, our economics more effectively, we might find that we're saving money overall. The question is, who pays for it? And I very much agree. I think Anne Manus has given a very good, um, a very good answer. But it's around what the customer wants. And that was my first point of consideration is what are you providing the services that the customer is willing to pay for. Thank you both. So for now, this concludes our first discussion period. We will have a much longer one coming up and we look forward to more discussion with both of you along with the other speakers. So let us go on to our, our third speaker. Azri is a sub-coordinator of domestic wastewater and small-scale drainage planning within the Directorate General of Human Settlements Ministry of Works and Housing in Indonesia. She works closely with, with local governments to improve wastewater management in the city or Regency level. We welcome you, Azri, and look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Andrea. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I'm talking about the mixed approach on accelerating sanitation development in, our, in my country, Indonesia, let's see uh, first our achievement to date on Indonesian sanitation sector. For now, our total access for basic, limited, and safely managed is around 79.53%, which mainly served by on-site system. Less than 5% is using the offset system. And only 764 is safely managed. And so to see that, that even if our growth rate per year is around 2%, and then the reduction rate of open defecation in Indonesia is around 1.5% per year, is still insufficient to be able to accept, uh, achieve the goals. The SDGs goals, the national midterm development plan, and also uh, what is the most important right now in Indonesia is also our minimum service standard, which state that every citizen has the right to have access to wastewater treatment. And uh, the minimum service standard quality is have to be safely access, safely managed access, except in like a rural area with density less than uh, 25 people per hectare. So it's quite a challenging uh, target for us. And so uh, uh, we realized in Indonesia that accelerating on development of infrastructure is uh, very important to uh, as a national sanitation policy. But we also uh, realized that to achieving sustainable sanitation service, we need to also emphasize on the improvement of the institutional to gain the commitment of the local key decision maker and also build a strong partnership and uh, finding the alternative funding to fund all the uh, acceleration of development of infrastructure and also the enhancing of the community awareness also very important. In Indonesia, we have uh, like a very uh, layer uh, government and also we have so many stakeholders on sanitation, even in the government level. That's why coordination is a key. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, we are uh, have the sanitation working group in each layer. 
to be able to support the coordination. So um, we have this program, like a national program uh, of the acceleration of sanitation development in Indonesia. Uh, it's already now in the stage three, where uh, in the beginning stage in 2010 until 2014, we do the planning stage when we made the city or regency sanitation strategy book. In 2015 and 2020, we start to plan to have implementation of those. Uh, whether we do the review of the current books that is already established, or we do uh, we make a new one for because like Indonesia we have more than 500 cities or agencies. So until now we have 487 cities who has the CSS book. We hope that in the next five years, in 2020 and the 2024, we will have uh, more commitment from the regional heads and central government to support uh, the implementation of the acceleration of the CSS book. Because, uh, and also we will have a trial for the limited scale service model in the first year, and we hope in the second uh, until the five year, we will have the full scale service model of uh, the implementation of the city uh, sanitation uh, strategy books. In this book is where we do the city-wide inclusive sanitation approach. We have the mix and match of the approach. We put it in this book. Um, because, uh, and, and this book, not only talking about uh, so, uh, wastewater, domestic wastewater, but also we are here planning about the solid waste. Um, the city sanitation uh, strategy book we use as a guidelines and shows the roadmap on our development plan of sanitation for its cities and regencies because every city and regency has different approach and have different characteristics. So no one for all fit solution in Indonesia. Uh, and also uh, the city sanitation uh, strategy book made by the city sanitation, as I said, a working group earlier. And also, it's not uh, finished there. So the CSS book, usually we follow by establishing also master plan for the city, especially for the uh, city or agency who has like a, a big uh, population. Yeah? And also for the uh, very important project, we will have feasibility study and continue with the detailed engineering design. Um, for uh, especially for the big one, for the small one, we usually uh, do many things uh, to be able to achieve like all the uh, mix and match uh, approach for the development and acceleration of the sanitation surface. We in Indonesia we realize that we need to collaborating uh, multiple types of programs because uh, in maybe in one cities a uh, few programs are more uh, development in another cities and maybe in another program uh, is in contrary. So we have to collaborate this. We have many uh, alternating of source of funding and programs. If you can see in the slide that we have the, now we do many community-based sanitation, especially for the uh, low income people. And also uh, we have many uh, like a grants from national for the cities and we have uh, transfer funds. Uh, so we do the national budget, but it's done by the city or agency itself by output-based uh, program. And also we now uh, try to, because in Indonesia, as I said earlier, we are like uh, mainly using the onset system. So faculty such management in each city is an important thing to be able to achieve a safely managed sanitation. If you see our budget, we have this uh, requirement for the uh, sanitation budget is around 192 trillion rup rupiah. And uh, most of them still coming from the national budget. That's why we need to improve uh, all the source of funding that we can uh, get. And also, when we talk about funding, we are not talking only about the infrastructure, yeah? We are also talking about the non-physical, as I said, like for the institutional, for the um, regulation, and also for the management. Uh, I ha want to show you one of the example uh, about the city-wide inclusive sanitation development in Indonesia. Right now in Makassar, as an example, we are now trying to make like a city a scale severage uh, using like a mixed funding also by loan uh, from ADB and also uh, by national budget and also from the city budget. So it's like multiple funding. And for the other, because now we are, as I say, uh, mainly do 
uh, sanitation surface by the on-site. So we, we have also like uh, individual septic tanks by maybe providing by self-funded by household or maybe from the city government budget or by based on grant. And also we have the, the sludging and regular sludging. Also uh, small scale with water treatment plan as an intermediate solution. Uh, we use mix and match national budget and city budget. And sometimes we do also the CSR for it. Uh, city sanitation book, which uh, in Makassar is already translated into the uh, master plan FS and also the uh, uh, detail design and also now implementation. So we hope uh, Makassar will be one of the examples. We have some consideration for the technology, but uh, all the consideration, especially uh, mostly based on the land, capex and opex, and also one of the most important is number eight, the beneficiary ability and willingness to pay and also the willingness to connect. Uh, and we have now uh, also the challenge for us is to be able to uh, operation in operational challenge is to be able to complying with the new standard because we have the old standard which is quite lower and then now we have strict standard from 2016 is very um, important. This is what we do in Indonesia um, for the last more than 15 years is to have a stepwise approach on the technology selection. So. We can, uh, it's based on the capability on providing sufficient O and M fund is a crucial point for us on choosing which technology that we should implement. So like sometimes we use when we want to do it like in the small scale one, we can use the onset system. Of course, the individual septic tank or communal septic tank can also uh, be complement with the, of course, the septic treatment and the desaging uh, regular and non-regular one. Well, for the uh, intermediate solution, we use still the uh, style with the anaerobic buffer reactor, anaerobic uh, filter, and also biofilter anaerobic aerobic. Well, for the uh, bigger scale one, of course, for the city scale one, based on, again, for the capability on providing the sufficient, sufficient OM for the sustainability, we will do whatever it takes. Usually, because uh, of the construct of the land, then we choose more higher technology in some cities rather than the others. Uh, on my last slides, what the key lesson, uh, lesson that we learned in Indonesia on doing the improvement of accelerating the development of sanitation access. Of course, continue intensive advocacy at all levels is very important for us. Also, uh, creating strong coordination between different institutions, as I said, so many institutions in Indonesia dealing with sanitation and also the local government. Of course, we need to empower them and in the national level, we do technical assistance, technical and non-technical also. And also collaborating with multiple program, multiple development partners in Indonesia, many development partners we're working with uh, and also we try to encourage innovating in funding mechanism and still promoting behavior changes to understand better the implement of the proper. And also in the last one that is very, very important for Indonesia is uh, when we use the community-based sanitation service, especially in the uh, low-income area, it's very help us to also uh, not only give a stepwise solution, but also helping them about the rec economical recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Asri, for your presentation. That's wonderful examples. Let's go to our last speaker now. Choi Kand is with the Ministry of Environment and Tourism in Mongolia. She's the project manager for a project called Managing Soil Pollution Through Improved On-Site Sanitation and Gare Areas of Ulaanbaatar City. This project addressed gender and environmental concerns of the large urban settlement and established a complete human fecal waste management cycle in the Mongolian context. Choi Khan, we look forward to your presentation. You have the stage. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me for sharing my experience about the on-site sanitation in Mongolia. Mongolia has a land size of 1.6 million square kilometers and population of 3.4 million is the world's uh, most sparsely populated countries. So landlocked between Russia and China, Mongolia has shown steady growth in the recent years. Culturally, the, uh, culturally and historically livestock raising by nomadic herders has been the major economic activity. And in the early 20th century, industrialization, uh, modern urban settlement 
began in the spirit by the Savage Union. The climate is cold over 200 days of the year. The winter is extremely cold, which I mean the minus 40 Celsius. The capital city called Ulaanbaatar that has uh, 1.5 million um, inhabitants and uh, the city has very diverse features. One hand, uh, the city is progressively developed modern met metropolitan and high rising buildings um, that connected to centralized infrastructures. The city has a basic or the luxurious living environment and the contrary, the gate areas uh, are the uh, peri-urban, mostly unplanned settlements that have uh, expanded around the city. In gate areas, there are a number of uh, challenges to address, such as poverty, unemployment, alcoholism, and environmental pollution, the public health issues, and so on. In addition, the most importantly, the pit latrine is the biggest concern in Ulaanbaatar gate areas. Uh, almost 96% of the gear areas of Ulaanbaatar city is depending on the basic pit latrines today. And 95% of the people buy the water, uh, water at the water kiosks and transport to their homes. There is a COVID spread. Even before the COVID spread, the government has a, a number of plans to provide the mortgage to move people to apartment housing uh, served by the pipe at water supply and sewerage networks, but it will take time, definitely considered a source of resources needed to invest. Uh, even if the current plans are fully implemented by 2030, at least 400 people in Ulaanbaatar cities uh, will be not connected to a municipal sewering system. So pit latrines are the built by the uh, normally the built by the uh, second hand materials and conventional pit latrines are frequently consist of few planks over the collapsing pit and facilities are often unpleasant, unsafe and unhygienic, frightening for children and accessible to rats and insects, other vermin that, vermin that spread fecal matter into the environment. Therefore, the biggest question was, to respond, what are the main measures that should be implemented technically, socially, institutionally, legally, financially to deliver sustainable improved on-site sanitation service in gear areas of Ulaanbaatar? When you see from the picture, there is a number of open or closed pit latrines, even the last facility you are using in your plots. In 2016, Asian Development Bank and Ministry of Environment and Tourism has initiated the pilot project is the managing soil pollution through improved on-site sanitation in gate areas. Using the grant provided by the government of Japan through the Japan Fund for Poverty Reduction, the fund was 2.8 million US dollars. The main outcome of the project was to improve public health conditions and reduce the soil pollution in gear areas. To achieve that main outcome, the three um, outputs were determined. The first was the planning for the on-site sanitation should be strengthened. The second, the uh, improved on-site sanitation life cycle must be piloted. Under this uh, output, 1,500 individual uh, improved on-site sanitation should be uh, built and installed in gear areas. The last, last uh, uh, output was sustainably, sustainability for improved on-site sanitation should be maintained. If possible, the project output outcome should be scaled up. Before uh, we started the project, there were a number of small and medium scale projects were implemented in Ulaanbaatar city in, or any other, uh, um, other urban settlements of Mongolia. Many of them were failed or discontinued. Uh, improved on site sanitation options were also affected by the hydro, uh, hydrogeological or geological factors or economic conditions, cultural preferences or population density or the land tenure, housing types, construction or operation costs. All these sorts of things are becoming biggest obstacle uh, to uh, continue those projects. So we, when we uh, start this project, there is a number of challenges that we faced and the limited 
definitely the first one is the limited volume of water available in most of the households in the gear areas. As I just mentioned, almost 95% of the gear areas are disconnected with the water sources. And uh, when we just started the number of uh, engagements with the communities uh, in gear areas, the most of them is uh, definitely would like to have a flush toilet options. But the, the sewers and safety tanks is also not um, even a requested, most requested option, but it was not feasible because the sources are still out of the scope. In addition, uh, then uh, number of uh, households, almost 25% uh, of the piloted gear areas Households were report that the hydrogeological conditions make it difficult to dig a pit latrines on their plots. So therefore, uh, we need to find the most suitable or the quest more practical and affordable technical solutions. If it exists, we have to bring to the project and apply the these technical solutions in the in such a cold climate. The project was uh, then answering these questions. And uh, when we just go to the uh, policy documents and the requirements, the Mongolia has recently approved the national standard. It's called the MNS 5924 2015. The national standard was uh, actually accepted four different types of uh, prototypes of on site sanitation. When we start the GEAR community meetings and the stakeholder engagement process through the project, we found that the most importantly, the GEAR area residents want to improve their sanitation. Uh, it means they have a willingness to pay or invest or engage the project. We found the most, uh, then, uh, most households uh, own their uh, plot land, so they are willing to invest it uh, and improve their residential arrangements. However, plots were not very large, so there is a space for sanitation facilities. Also, people have a little knowledge of how they could improve their facilities, uh, sanitation facilities, especially given the residents restraints imposed by the uh, limited financial means and by uh, very cold climatic conditions. After a series of meetings and the community engagement process, out of four different options, as you see, there is a two selected options. We identified these two options are most feasible. And uh, as illustrated in this slide, the first, whole, first one is called Holton Tank. And the second one is, second option for the project was the Ecosan. To build uh, the construction materials are very simple and available on the domestic market. And to install, there is not necessary to have a big uh, equipment. The later process of the management uh, is uh, the crucial because uh, to sustain the, such uh, on-site sanitation, you need an empty service and collection service. And this needs to be uh, much uh, charging the households uh, in the cheapest as possible. So. Improving on-site sanitation gear areas is uh, from the, uh, just summarizing, uh, uh, improving on-site sanitation gear areas in Mongolia was possible, but options are very limited. And uh, definitely uh, improved on-site sanitation uh, system should be considered as the uh, option, uh, the uh, consider is the system, not just the facility. And the entire service chain needs to be considered, including management of waste from the capture to contain, containment to conveyance to the treatment and the potential reuse or final disposal. Otherwise, the improper reuse or disposal of etc. poses uh, a risk to public health and the environment. So the most uh, cost-effective and sustainable options uh, will generally be the least complex and uh, costly, not costly technologies that should be desired to the uh, uh, households in gear areas in Mongolia. Then the services uh, to consumer uh, should be the uh, protecting, uh, should be uh, less uh, costly. Talk costs to user and the providers 
over the entire fecal waste management must be considered uh, considered in the future at the policy uh, makers and the required further investment in such a cold climate. Then the current arrangement is uh, uh, arrangements in Ulaanbaatar involves discharge of the sludge to sewer main pipelines and as you know the, there is a this option uh, we implemented in under this uh, project was just uh, uh, complementary to supporting the uh, centralized expanding system. With this project, we definitely easy replicable designs and prototypes we identified under this uh, national standard. That was the uh, key issues. And during this uh, project implementation, number of uh, women and children were in. Uh, Thank to the project uh, implementing team uh, and supported the uh, Asian Development Bank. And also uh, it was a great, great experience going through this uh, project implemented in Mongolia. Thank you so much, Joyka. And that was a fascinating presentation. And I'm sure people will have many questions for you. Before we get started in our discussion period, where we have about 25 minutes together with questions and answers for our speakers, but let's get started into the conversation now. I would like to start with a question for each one of you in turn, and then there are a number of questions that all of you may like to weigh in on, and then we'll, we'll get to those. So let me start with uh, Troikan with a question for you. It was very inspiring to hear about your project. And what we'd like to know is, are there plans to replicate or scale up the project to the bigger population in Ulaanbaatar? Um, the, when we start this project, there is a very few hope or the trust uh, between the uh, stakeholders. After, replica, uh, after implementing this project, uh, the Ministry of Environment is the executing agency, has uh, the vision, and uh, the national uh, national committee for the pollution, environmental pollution, is taking our um, drawings, architectural drawings of the simple on-site sanitation um, prototypes, and it is uh, scaled up. And uh, now in Ulaanbaatar city, there is a uh, uh, at least 2,000 um, improved on-site sanitation is going to be uh, built and installed in the water main water stream uh, water streams of the Tool River, and definitely that was the invested by the government budget, and uh, it is scaled up already. That's fantastic. <laughs> What do you think made the difference? What what allowed that to happen specifically? Um, okay, the first thing is the government is paying much more attention on the sources first source of the uh, waste, and the later uh, parts. The, it is the chain of process, and the government must understand there is a extension or the more investment needed the later process collection and also the treatment uh, parts, they need more investment. At the moment, yes, we, are, we have the, the good, uh, good uh, solutions or uh, prototypes that we can build in the first source of the West, but uh, later uh, the chain of the management required different type of investments. Thank you very much, thank you. To Azri, I have a question for you. Uh, it's from one of our participants. They were asking, does Indonesia have any public-private partnerships for sanitation and sewerage? For now, um, for the big scale, like um, uh, city scale sewerage, we are not yet uh, have any public-private partnership for the uh, sewer uh, system. Uh, but for the small scale one, like uh, dislodging, so like dislodging surface, we have some of the small part, um, collaboration with the private company uh, in that level. But for the, like uh, having the PPP for the sewerage, not yet, Andrea. Thank you very much. To you, Manas, and a question from a participant as well, asking 
Uh, this, India recently tightened regulations and no longer allows DWATs. If you could explain what that means to everyone when you answer, uh, isn't this counterproductive leading to even lower affordable solutions? So DWATs uh, stand simply for decentralized wastewater treatment systems, which is you know, small scale STPs. Um, so DWATs has been popularized by BORDA in India and we use nature-based solutions where because, uh, because it's nature-based, uh, you, know, you don't always have complete uh, process control and um, your output BOD, COD, and other uh, parameters might vary. Uh, in the cities, the regulators have tightened, uh, tightened the parameters for the effluent, for the outflow from the STP, and a traditional DWATs will no longer meet those standards. So you'll have to take a DWATs and then you can add specific filters and other things at the end of it. So you still get most of the benefit of the DWATs, but not all of it into the low cost and, um, and the low energy, uh, but you can still adapt the DWAT system to it. But then there are other technologies for small scale. You know, that graph that I showed very briefly, we evaluated eight technologies and at least six or seven or five or six of those could quite easily meet the standards. The other two or three will have to do some adaptation uh, in order to meet those standards. So it's still not a big challenge. Uh, is it counterproductive? Yes, it is because it does drive up the cost of wastewater treatment systems. And that means that if you want it to work, you have to do even stronger enforcement, which is a, a you know, greater burden on the government. Um, is it a deal breaker? Is it a big problem? You know, it's, it's not a very thoughtful way of going about it, uh, but it's not a huge, huge problem, but we'd prefer that they put in more thought into these standards and uh, solve the problem rather than importing standards from somewhere else in the world, which have very different situations and challenges from um, the Indian context. So um, I, I, I don't want to take too much time on this question, but I hope this gives a sense and I'm happy to connect uh, offline with anyone who wants more information. Thank you, Manas. That's a great start. And then over to you, Isabel. Uh, there was uh, some interest in the willingness to pay concept here through several of the presentations. So the question to you is, do you know of any best practices to increase willingness to pay? Willingness to pay needs to start with what the consumer wants and understanding the consumer. Um, a typical mistake of sanitation programs is to promote them on the basis of increased health because most consumers don't understand the connection between sanitation and health. But what they do understand is they may want uh, less smell in the environment. They may want a cleaner environment. There are, they may not like their toilet. They may not be able to afford to get their tank emptied. So, um, I, I would say the best practice is to almost apply commercial um, advertising techniques and understand your consumer um, and, and use that as the basis of a campaign. Usually, some form of behavior change, social marketing campaign will be required. And I think that's the basis on which you can increase willingness to pay. However, I also think that technology choice and choosing the right technology um, and uh, a technology that is actually affordable to the consumer is, is really critical. Thank you so much, Isabel. I'd like to actually build on that. Since we have three very different parts of the world represented here, willingness to pay, but also cultural acceptance of the technologies, I'd love to hear from each one of you, uh, Asri, Manas, and Joycon, about that aspect of it. And we'll start with Asri with you, uh, and then go to Manas and then Joycon. What what had, do you did you observe or have to say about willingness to pay or cultural acceptance of technologies? Um, yes, Andrea. In Indonesia, um, even between um, each island, there will be very different cultural aspect. I, I, Isabel knows it well, actually. But um, yes, actually, uh, as I say in my presentation, that one of the most important thing that we observe before we say that a project is feasible or not, is the acceptance uh, from the people uh, in cultural aspect and also the willingness to pay and willingness to connect. Because without that, we will struggle with the connectivity. That's what uh, we always do. So we try during the feasibility study, we try to see like what is the most convenient technology uh, that people use. That's why we don't really use the dry toilet in Indonesia because our culture is rarely used uh, that dry toilet stuff or something. So people, so in Indonesia, if you want to build sanitation infrastructure, we always say that one of the precondition is sufficient water supply in that area. So something like that, that we always consider. 
Maybe like Thank that, Thank you Andrea? so much, Jasmine. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Over to you, Manas. What are your points of view on willingness to pay and cultural acceptance? Well, I think with cultural acceptance, uh, you know, look, NIMBY, not in my backyard, is a very, very real concept in India. Uh, nobody wants a treatment plant, a dumping ground in their backyard. And I think that's, that would hold for anyone. Uh, therefore, you need to make solutions very clean, odorless. They have to look safe. They have to feel safe. And that's why when you saw some of the photos, all our treatment plants, we try very hard to make sure there's no odor and it literally looks like a garden. Our plant in Leh, before we built, before the municipality built a gate there, people from the nearby housing quality used, a colony used to come every evening and take a walk because that is the nicest road in the vicinity. Okay, And there was no smell, no problem. Used to worry kids may fall into the pits though. Now, uh, so I think that's one thing is that, you know, we have to design systems well and not design things shoddily, uh, you know, that, that's that's the basic, uh, this thing. And uh, acceptance to pay is there, but it takes time. So government has to look at this from a wider perspective and be willing to put in that initial money until people understand that the service is real, it is here to stay and it helps us. And then people will be willing to pay. At the same time, you have to choose solutions and technologies that are affordable. You can't, you can't implement high end, high cost technologies in a poor country and then expect that people will somehow pay up and then you don't maintain it and then it gets destroyed and you lose a lot of money doing that. So we believe in systems, simple, low-cost solutions that get the job done and make people feel safe. And I think then you, you know, you'll have far fewer problems. Thank you, Manas. Joy Kand, what's your point of view and your observations about willingness to pay and cultural acceptance? Uh -huh. um, as I just mentioned that Mongolia is a nomadic, has a very uh, strong nomadic culture. The settlements, urbanization started very recently. And now this uh, problem is the first time for Mongolians, how to manage it, sludge, fecal waste, all these sorts of things is, even it was centuries, but it was not settled like this together. So it was very difficult. And the recent um, 30 years, people uh, migrated from the, uh, rural areas to the city, and now the, these scary areas is mainly uh, uh, by those nomadic herders. And then, uh, then people have a very uh, uh, even they have an interest to willing to pay, but the paying cost is not really um, uh, meet the the. High maintained, high, highly man, maintained, or the costly uh, solutions. So, the first of all, to for the uh, solution, and it should be very simple. And the plots of the gear areas is cheaper. Then you don't need the big uh, septic tank or the high uh, luxury uh, technologies. It should be very simple, and it should not ne necessary to change the. Uh, the, the customs or habits, then that's the, the, the simplest should be. And then it should be also low tech. It's not necessary to be a luxury or the, you press the button and everything is going to be solved. And people also, as many other countries, uh, just Manas just mentioned, they don't like to keep the, the West in their uh, plots. So it should be a, uh, some kind sort of next uh, stages should be uh, transported to somewhere else in the factory environment or a facility environment should be treated and managed. That's people would like to know, uh, do. And also they will pay for that. That's uh, for sure. If it is not expensive, people will need to pay the, uh, the empty service and the collection service from the experience of this project. Thank you so much, Choi Khan. I'd like to go to another question now that uh, builds on the topic of this webinar about the, this mix and match idea and this mix and match, but also the holistic uh, solutions that Manas mentioned in, in his presentation. So the, the specific question from one of our uh, participants was, what do you, the presenters think about considering rainwater, drainage water and solid waste management as well as fecal waste as part of an integrated packet, a package of sanitation improvements? So I see you nodding, Mana. So why don't we start with you and then go to uh, Asri and, and then Isabel and then Choi Kand. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and, and I actually did answer that question uh, maybe further down. Uh, look, the city is the city is an integrated unit. All right, when we take the human body, and the more we specialize and we say this is you know brain science, this is heart science, this is lung science, you lose the ability to see the whole picture and you create more problems because you don't understand what happens at the intersection and you lose the synergies there. The city is no different. So while I understand that for technical reasons, administrative reasons. We need to have departments that do different things. And we need to say, this is wash and this is something else. The more we can blur those boundaries or the fewer boundaries we can have, I think we'll get more synergies across the problems. We'll solve our problems more effectively. I think you know, one thing that is coming up is this whole territorial approach uh, to development. And that says, you know, look at us, look at at least a, even if not the whole city, take a neighborhood and look at it more holistically in terms of all the different solutions and infrastructure. And I think that has a potential to really decentralize accountability and system design to say, okay, how do we solve all these interconnected problems in one neighborhood or one part of the city, even if we can't do it for the whole city? And maybe that's another way instead of taking sewers for the whole city, solid waste for the whole city, to say, can we do something at a neighborhood level where we integrate and, and get the synergies? Because you know everything requires land, everything requires money, everything requires manpower, everything requires electricity. If you're going to do everything separately, you'll just require more of that than if you find those those synergies. Thank you so much, Manas. Asri, would you like to weigh in on this question about integrating multiple aspects of, of infrastructure? It's very interesting, actually. Uh, in our, as I mentioned before, in our city sanitation book and. Uh, in my directorate, we, we say we see sanitation is as a combine of the wastewater management and also drainage uh, in a, um, a community level drainage and also the solid waste. So we try to integrate, but it's not that easy actually because, like as Manas already mentioned, that is. Uh, depends very, especially in Indonesia, we have this geographical challenge actually. So to be able to um, integrate them, actually it's a very good idea. In, um, the in, in the next future, in some city, we are planning to do that in the end, like uh, have this nexus approach for the wastewater and solid waste or something like that. But for now on, we are still uh, trying to be able to serve all the citizens the city, citizen first, uh, Andrea, in that part. But I think uh, the idea to be able to manage them all in one state, it will be good, but maybe not for the whole city. Maybe in like some of the uh, special area, like in the special district, like a very, very uh, dense popularity and everything. So maybe we can do in some part of the city or the regencies. Thank you, Of course, Asri. also uh, the money for the operational and maintenance will be the main constraint to be able to mix and match approach. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel, over to you. I know you're deeply involved in FSM. You might have a slightly different perspective on things. No, I, I entirely agree with Manas and Asri and what they've said. Um, I couldn't agree more. One of the CWIS principles is that you integrate basic urban services, and by basic urban services, we mean water supply and drainage, grey water, um, and all the different waste streams, stormwater. Um, I think the absolute minimum that can happen in every city is the coordination and the discussion between the agencies. I think that's the minimum that is required, that they're sitting down and they're talking, and that you're not contradicting each other, you're not digging up the streets multiple times. But as I think both Manas and Azri have already said, what you ideally want is coordinated uh, effort in areas and projects that are integrated. So if you want to shoot for best practice, you go for integrated projects and interventions. But I don't think anyone should go below the coordination and the discussion between agencies to mean at least you're programming. You know what each other's doing. You know what each other's planning. And you try and make it work better together. Thank you, Isabel. And Choi Khan, would you like to weigh in on this question of integration as well? Okay, um, definitely. I'm supporting previous speakers. And uh, for Mongolia, we have uh, the solid waste management um, policy taking place uh, for the last 30 years and uh, very strong of solid waste management. But uh, now this sludge management issues were discussed in the policy level uh, from 
uh, since 2016. Hopefully it is going to be integrated as uh, we discussed, and hopefully the city, Ulaanbaatar city is going to consider this uh, issue. It should be integrated and it will uh, definitely uh, solve, uh, save uh, lots of resources in this field. Thank you, thank you. We just have a few minutes left, so I'd just like to skip around a little bit. I have one question here uh, saying that sanitation and water are coupled. What are the challenges water, of water scarcity or finite water in the implementation of such sanitation programs in specific localities? And I expect this applies mostly to uh, India and to Mongolia for our speakers here. So Manas or Choikan, uh, would you like to reply to that particular question about how you deal with water scarcity? Choikan, would you like to start us off? Yes. Uh, the under this project, we uh, tested two prototypes. Those two prototypes, both not using any water sources. It's uh, basically the dry toilet. toilet. So um, it is uh, definitely going to help to use, reduce their water use and also going to prevent the uh, groundwater from the contamination. So it was the uh, practice of the dry toilet usage in Mongolia. Thank you. Manas? Yeah, I would say broadly in India, we don't, we don't think too much about water shortage. We complain a lot about it and we worry a lot about it, but we don't seem to think and do much about it. Um, so in, in our system, you know, we've been promoting the idea of reusing the treated sewage extensively. We have designed and helped to build over 400 systems. As I said, you know, Bangalore City alone has got over 3,000 STPs. Many of them don't work though, because you know, water supply from the municipality is very inexpensive. So why spend money on running your STP? Uh, but I think uh, I think it's a very important question. And uh, you know, if you can if you can reuse a lot of your wastewater, that's why we believe that small scale STPs really are the solution. Often with big STPs, the centralized STPs, you know, if you get 100 million liters of water being treated in one point, it's very hard then to distribute that again for reuse. If you are dealing with a million, half a million, hundred thousand liters at a point, you can you you can actually reuse that very easily. Uh, for things like flushing, landscaping, uh, you know, non non contact uh, applications, as we as we call it. Uh, so I think it it needs to become, and that's why we we talk about government taking a serious role in enforcing this because people are willing to spend if they have to. There's three thousand people in Bangalore built the system, but if you don't follow up and enforce the regulation, they will stop using it because it costs money to do so. But if you enforce the regulation, they will use it, they will complain, then they will get used to it, and then they'll stop complaining, and that, and that's when your job is kind of easier. Thank you very much. I have a question here, which I think is for all. And I'd like you, if you're interested in answering it, if you just raise your hand that to give me an idea if you want to say something. So the question is this, could the speakers share or comment on the added value of private financing institutions or public private partnerships to implementing decentralized wastewater systems based on actual success stories? So just give me a signal if you'd like to answer. Manas, you were nodding your head. Does that say, does that mean you have something to say? I, I could if nobody else has anything to say. Um, Isabel, okay. would you like to? I think first of all, there's quite a lot of experience in more middle income upmarket type of settlement for private financing small scale systems yeah. but as yet there's not much experience for investing private finance in lower income settlements i think that's simply over to you manas yeah no, I, I agree with that uh, if you're looking for examples in fsm uh, if you look at andhra pradesh and telangana two states in southern india uh, they released this you know fairly large packages where they bundled towns together and gave out fsm contracts to players uh, now, the contracts are quite good. The government is you know, reasonably trustworthy. Uh, there were hybrid annuity models, 10-year contracts, and yet even public sector banks were unwilling to finance contracts issued by the government. So there's certainly a role there. It may not be a very profitable role. You need to understand the situation and manage the risk, but I think there's a role to be played by, by private finance agencies and certainly large institutions like ADB and the World Bank in, uh, in you know, encouraging such contracts by the government and then supporting the private players who win them 
to uh, you know by financing it uh, you know at, at, at affordable rates uh, to encourage success there because their success will breed more replication and that's what we are looking for uh, in small scale uh, sanitation again you know water supply is very cheap but that's your real benefit of small scale stps is the free water you get in areas where water supply becoming a problem and people have to buy tankers uh, their stp suddenly are golden to you you're saving money on it therefore you will run it if we can finance the real estate developers the housing societies the institutions to build those systems uh, again with the right kind of structure where over long term they save money because of uh, the water what the water aspect i think there's definitely a play there it's not it's not a slam dunk uh, investment deal but there are opportunities i would say in india and certainly other places it requires some thought and some careful you know uh, maneuvering or uh, modeling but i think the opportunities are there and they'll become more in the coming in the coming years given both the water shortage and by uh, regulations which i hope will get enforced thank you manas so i want to ask one more question just because we're trying to get in as many questions from our participants as we can so i'll direct this question to asri asri um how are how did you and in, in how do you in indonesia consider onm when you're selecting or operations and maintenance considerations when you are selecting technologies for different locations so we usually um, coordinate uh, intensively with the pemda so looking through their financial capacity fiscal capacity and also their uh, each year uh, capability on spending on sanitation sector something like that at the beginning and plus we also uh, have this like um, a specific uh, survey and uh, study for the willingness and capability to pay from the and then we are uh, combine those to to see like how much the money that is uh, available for the operational and maintenance thank you very much yes so does anyone else want to weigh in on that question i think we have a, just one more minute left to do uh, that and can i um um add something because like i forgot to say it. yes um like um as i say before like if there uh, we have to see that their willingness to connect and willingness to pay but it's not uh, necessarily like since if the beginning the people in uh, one district say no we don't really uh, need that then we directly exclude them it's not like that but then we will do layering socialization so since the uh, feasibility study and then later on during the detailed design we do more socialization and then during the construction and we hope in the end they will uh, willing to connect so it's like a long process of socialization and in some part that we try to already like in bali it works this an extra thank you so much thank you thank you so much all and i'm afraid we're coming to the end of our of our time here together so i, I want to thank all of our speakers very heartily Manas, I see your finger. Can you can you say what you need to say in thirty seconds? Yeah, yes. I think okay. looking at life cycle cost changes perspective a lot, and I think that's what we need to use to convince people rather than the upfront cost which scares people sometimes. That's all. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, Isabel, who started us off by giving us a good introduction, Manas, with your perspective on holistic systems, Asri, with your Indonesian perspective, and Choikan, with uh, your Mongolian perspective. Thank you, all of you. And now, with just a few concluding remarks and some reminders for the participants, uh, we have heard great presentations here reminding us that citywide inclusive sanitation does not mean adopting one technology or system. Instead, it means being selective. And it's useful to look holistically for solutions much broader than a single project, for example. I, I would also well, thank speakers. I'd like to thank our participants for your participation. It's your questions, your juicy questions that made this discussion possible. So let's keep that conversation going in the, the next three workshops and uh, webinars that are coming up. A few other reminders. We would love to hear from you what you thought about today's session. There is a survey being posted in the chat link for you to answer, and uh, the same survey link will be provided to you in a separate email. It takes just a few minutes to fill out. We look at the results every day to see if we can improve the next webinar day by day. So we thank you for your comments. If you're looking for copies of the materials, the presentations you heard today will be posted on the event website within 24 hours. You may also download the recording of this meeting by the end of this week on Friday. 
Also, if you have any further questions or need, feel the need to contact the event organizers or any of the speakers, please refer to the email addresses provided at the bottom of the slide. Coming up next is workshop number three in the how to series about leveraging the links between water, sanitation, hygiene, and health. That's continuing on our theme of integration here today. And then next Monday, we have webinar four on sex, sanctity, and sanitation, perhaps the most provocatively titled webinar in the series, as well as workshop four. And so with that, I leave you, I wish you good morning, good day, and good night, and look forward to seeing you next uh, Monday. Take care, everybody.